I want to get I want to get to work and I want to start a, a brand new four week series with you on the power of your words. So many people do not like the direction of your life. They don't like the way life is going right now. And if you you say if I could just change my and you could fill in the blank. If I could just change my job if I could just change my future, if I could just change my finances, if I could just change my, my relationships, then everything would be okay. Here's what I need you to know. In the Bible, there are spiritual principles, which are great to live by, but there's also things called spiritual laws. And those are a little higher than that. Like, like there's spiritual laws, like the law of sowing and reaping. There's the law of, of seed, well, seed time and harvest. The law, Romans 8 talks about the law of sin and death. Then it also talks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Well, there's another spiritual law that we oftentimes overlook, and that is that your words have the power to change your life. The words that come out of your mouth, this is going to be for four weeks, and the reason that I would do a four-week series on one thought like this is because this is affecting your life more than you think. In Proverbs chapter 18, this will be our, our text for this series. He says, you will have to live with the consequences of everything that you say. What you say can preserve life or destroy it. So you must accept the consequences of your words. I mean, wow, like that's such a powerful, powerful verse. And in fact, if you told me that the Bible said this without showing me a verse, I wouldn't even believe that. That there could be something like this in the Bible that says that your words have power to them. There's consequences to your words that you can, what you say can preserve life or destroy it. So here's what I'm saying is if you change your words, you can change and you can fill in the blank. Like he said, well, I just need to, you know, maybe before you trade in your spouse, maybe change your words. Maybe before you quit your job, maybe change your words. Maybe, I mean, because words have that much power. You know, maybe before you blame someone else for something happening in your life, ch- what if we just changed our words? And the, and the reality of it is these words are so powerful that it's a spiritual law. Now, I need to let you know something because the word, the Bible says that even our world was created by words. God used his words to create the world that we're in. If you were to go back and read Genesis chapter one, I would do a quick study and it would just say, and God said, and God saw, and God said, and God saw, and God said, and God saw. So if you don't like what you're seeing, maybe change what you're saying. Now, as with any spiritual law, there are extremes. Your enemy, he's very good at this. Whenever something is a really strong law, principle in the Bible, he will take it to the extreme. And, he'll, and he'll, he'll make it seem so strange and odd, like, like confession and like the power of your words. And well, the Bible doesn't say, sit on your couch and just call money in. Right. You know, it's like, you know, like, like if I were to do a wedding, I would, somewhere in a wedding, I just did a ceremony last, two weeks ago in California. And if I were to do a ceremony, somewhere in the ceremony, I would talk about love. And I'd say, now this is the law by which your marriage is to be conducted. And, but you know what? That doesn't mean that love is all you need in a marriage. Because I, I talk to young couples and I say, well, I think you should do premarital counseling before you get married. No, we don't need that. I'm like, well, why not? Because we're in love. And love's going to fix everything. I say, honey, love don't pay the bills. Love don't fix what his parents didn't work in him. And the same thing with healing, like healing, Jesus paid the price for healing. He's our great physician. He's our great healer, but you can't confess calories away. Boy, I wish you could. If I could confess calories away, if I could just do that, I'd be okay. Like if I could just five pat 10 right here. You know what I found out? I am the right perfect weight. I'm just the wrong height. I got the right weight, but the wrong height. Just three inches. So, so I want to take you to a verse. It's in the book of James. Now, the thing about the James, the book of James, is my, it's, it's my favorite New Testament book. If I, and there's a reason why. In fact, a lot of theologians call the book of James the book of wisdom. And uh, it's, it's, 
Old Testament counterpart would be, honestly, the book of Proverbs. And the book of James is five chapters. It takes you 12 minutes to read it. If you have a fourth grade reading level, you can read that in about 12 minutes. It's just packed full of a lot of practical application. And the thing about James is he was a pastor, and, and James, honestly, he just spoke right where people lived. He wasn't really, Paul was a lot about theology and spiritual truths. James took those and made it very, very practical. And my guess, I would hope if I could relate to anybody in the New Testament, I would want to be more like James. Now, James, his claim to fame, he was the half-brother of Jesus. And, but he didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God until after Jesus died and was resurrected. In fact, I think it's one of the greatest cases that you could ever make for the deity of Jesus. That if your brother thinks you're the Son of God, you're the Son of God. But James, he, he has this practical book. He talks chapter one, he comes right out of the gate and starts talking about tests and trials. And then chapter two, he does something. He said in chapter two, hey, you can have faith and you can say you're a person of faith. And he has this famous line in there. He said, show me your faith by your works. He said, I want you to to connect some actions to what you say you believe. But then in chapter three, we're gonna come back to this in part three of this series. But in chapter three, he, he said this. He said, I want to see your faith in your words. A lot of us overlooked that. He said, I wanna see your faith in your actions. But he said, I wanna see your faith with the words that come out of your mouth. And in James chapter three and verse three, he said it like this. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account. We, we would think that like it's no big deal. But he said, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. Well, maybe I just need a miracle in my family. He said, well, maybe your words have something to do with whether you walk out that miracle or don't walk out that miracle. Well, I just need a miracle in my, in my job, my career. He said, well, your words, they don't seem like they're that important, but they can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark. One little word, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. Here's what he's trying to say. Here's what the writer of Proverbs said. We're gonna find out today, here's what Jesus is going to say. All through the Bible, here's what you need to know, that words matter to God. The words that you speak, they just matter to God. Now, here's what I want you to know, because there's some extremes. We're not trying to say, we're gonna to try to get God into agreement with our words. No, we're trying to get our words in agreement with God's words. It's not the other way around. Hebrews would say it like this in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse three. He said, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Here's just what he said. Your words frame your life. Like if you don't like the direction of your life, like you gotta just change the framework. I know when this building was being built, then it was just a massive canvas. 51,000 square feet, and it was just wide open. And then, I mean, a lot of prep work was done. They just worked and worked and worked and made it ready. I'm so grateful that they did that because I did, a, I did an account, and we've seen over 10,000 people saved in this building alone. I'm just so grateful for this. And so, and, so, and so here's the deal. But when they built this building, it was just a framework. It was just a can, blank canvas, just four outer walls. And you just... You saw what could be. In your mind, you, you had a hope of what it could be. And you'd see these plans. Now, for a builder, builders, they see plans, they understand them. But for someone like me, who's a novice at all that, I see plans and I go, yeah, I can kind of see it. But, but then when they started putting the frames, frames up around here, framing, and in each room, all of a sudden, when the framing went up, something on the inside sparked on the inside of me. Now, I know what it's going to look like. Now, I know what it's going to be. Let me tell you where I am as a pastor. When I start hearing words come out of people's mouth, I know what their future looks like. You say, well, I just don't like that. But the deal is, words matter to God. Here's what I'm trying to communicate to you. Your life is going in the direction of your words. Wow. My kids are punks. My kids, 
And we can say this, they just, they're just never obey. I'm never going to get married. No one's going to love me. Nobody cares about me. I realize those are true feelings that you have, but you need to know something that your life is going in the word direction of your words. As I said earlier, before you trade in your husband, maybe change your words. Before you change in your wife, before you quit your job. This is going to be a practical series. And we're going to have some hard-hitting moments. We're going to laugh a little bit. If I'm telling funny stories, it's because I know I'm getting ready to hit you with something really hard. Just, you just need to know. If you go to our church, you know how that works. But here's the reality. These, these are all out of the Bible. Proverbs 12 says this. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We just didn't know that. That our words like that could pierce. But I could also bring healing. You go, well, you just don't know who I live with. You don't know who I work for. You don't know the school that I go to, the family that I come from. And here's the reality. I get it. I've been all over the world. And everywhere I go, people say, well, we're Italians and we just speak our mind. Then you go to Europe and they go, well, we're just British. We just tell you like it is. Our Irish, we got a little bit of a temper. Forget about it. Latinos, come on, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> well, I'm just French. And everywhere you go, everybody has an excuse as to, as to why. But here's the reality. The Bible's trying to communicate a thought to you. that you, Nobody can make you say anything. And we have to take responsibility for our own words. Let me give you two thoughts today only, and I'm gonna wrap it up with a takeaway. But two main thoughts, and this is just a foundation to set us up for the next few weeks, and that is this, that our words connect us to God. Again, I can't believe that this is a, is a true statement until I see the scripture back it up. I just, when I read it in the Bible like I am right here, I say, well, it's shocking to me that the scriptures would say this, that, that our words actually connect us to God. I just can't believe that he would, he would allow us to have that kind of power. But in Romans chapter 10, it says this, but faith's way of getting right with God says, and notice this, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to the earth. A lot of us, if I could just get God to come down. He said, no, no, and don't say who will go down to the, the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message of salvation is very close at hand. It's on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. That if you would do something, if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by, here it is, and by with the words that come out of your mouth that you are saved. He said, I'm going to give you so much power that I'll do the work. But if you could get something in your heart and something in your mouth, it would connect you to God. Now, I know. Like, that's shocking to me. But that's what the Bible says, that your words carry that much power to connect with God. Jesus would say the same thought like this in Matthew chapter 12. Now let me give you a little context to this, this verse here. In Matthew 12, Jesus just went and healed this guy. And he, and he healed this guy. And man, it was, it was one of these incredible miracles. This guy was able to speak, wasn't able to see. Jesus healed him. And then the Pharisees were there. And they were like, wow. And they were trying to throw Jesus under the bus and they didn't want to see him gain any sort of traction in his ministry. And so they said, well, you know how he healed this guy? Because he's the devil and he works with the devil. And that's where we get the famous line where Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand. A nation divided cannot stand, which should increase your prayer life right now. And, and so, so he res, he's responding to that statement here. And he said, by the way, guys, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. Now, let me give you the, the key, the answer key to this. The tree is talking about your heart. The fruit is talking about your mouth, the words. 
And here's what he said. If you get your heart right, it'll show up in your mouth. If you get your heart is good, then your words will be good. If your heart's not in the right spot, if it's bad, then your words, your fruit will be bad. And he just, you gotta, Jesus is just different than the way Hollywood portrays him. You just need to know that. He's not a weak, wimpy, sickly, uh, I shouldn't say that word. I was going to say wuss, but I'm going to say it anyways. But in my house, maybe, not, maybe it's a cuss word in your house, but hey, he's just not that. He's not. He said, you brood of snakes. He's talking to the religious leaders. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good per- person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account. And and here's, these are just the words of Jesus. I just wish this verse wasn't in the Bible, personally. I don't like this verse. You ever read a verse and you go, well, like, is that a mistake? Like how could, and then when you read it and it's red letter, you're like, well, and then you do like me and I go back into the original Greek and the Hebrew and go, did they really mean that? And I try to context my way out of it. There's no way to context your way out of this. You can't Hebrew it. You can't Greek it. Here's what he said. He said this, you will give an account on judgment day for idle words that you speak. Well, I don't, just don't want that to be true. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. What he's trying to do here. Now, let me just give you some, a thought. Number one, grace is bigger than all your mistakes. Grace is the great eraser. The blood of Jesus is the great eraser. I think we could all stand up here and say, all of us need a series like this. All of us say things we wish we wouldn't say. All of us have regrets in our life. All of us wish we could take back words that come out of our mouth. We, we say them in haste. We say them in anger. We say them in the moment. We wish we could take them back. I need to let you know something. This is true, but there's also a law that talks about grace, that grace can erase. If you can get it under the blood of Jesus, if you can bring it to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. The Bible says this, grace doesn't cover, grace erases. He won't remember your sins as far as the east is from the west. That means they don't even exist. But that doesn't let us off the hook with knowing that our words have power. Jesus is trying to communicate something to you. There's no such thing as neutral words. Words are either going this direction or going that direction. That's how powerful your words are. So words They, number one, they connect. Words determine your future. Number two, they connect us to God. And then number three, words connect us to each other. That's how powerful words are. They'll actually connect us to other people. Now, because if you can go back and you can look in your life, just think this through. Think about your life. Think about your relationships. Think about the people in your life. Wherever there's relational problems, almost always under every circumstance, words were involved. That's just the way it is. Words just have that power. And arguably, the most famous scripture on words in the Bible, I I read it to you out of a different translation, but in the King James Version, it's Proverbs 18, 21, where it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's nothing new for probably people in this room today. That's not a new thought, a new scripture for you. That's not a revelation to you. But if you were to read Proverbs 18, and if you read the verses before verse 21 and the verses right after verse 21, you know what they're all about? Relationships. It's all about interacting with other people. And one, specifically, verse 22 and 23 are others about finding a wife. It's finding a marriage. In other words, When you disconnect from people and you have relationship issues, almost always you can look back and you can say, words were involved. I just want to say, some people have a bad relationship because we have bad words coming out of our mouth. We're speaking death over each other. Words just have this explosive power to bring change. And it's just the way it is. 
I wish it were different, but it's not. In fact, there's this verse in Samuel, and you know the story of David and Goliath. And let me set this story up for you. David and Goliath, there's this epic battle that, that happened. You know where Goliath, David took the five, the, uh, the slingshot and the five stones, and, you know, and, and knocked out Goliath. But before all that happened, something else was occurring. And let me set this up for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 23, it says, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him. I need you to hear that. David heard him. Shout his, here it is, his usual taunt to the army of Israel. There were words that he was speaking and it was terrifying Israel. It, the words that were coming out of his mouth were terrifying them. But I want to look at this phrase here. I like this in the New Living Translation. His usual taunt. I just wonder, when I was putting these thoughts together, I wonder if a lot of us have gotten sloppy a little bit, a little bit lazy in the way we speak to each other. And some things that were just, they've become usual. They've just become routine to us. His usual words. Now here's what I'm saying. His usual words, not his Sunday morning words. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. The Sunday morning words. If you have kids, I have five of them, I know you had a rough Sunday morning. Do you know why I drive the church by myself on Sunday? There's a reason why. I've even elevated my game. I leave the house before anyone gets up on a Sunday. You know why? I'm walking in love when I'm up here. But we have our usual, we have our usual words and then we have our Sunday morning words. I'm not talking about our Sunday morning words. How are you? Blessed and highly favored. How's things going? Great. Well, I'm, I'm talking to several thousand people on a Sunday. Here's what I know is this. Not everyone can be great, but that's what I hear. I'm great. I'm good. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. The Lord is with me. Goodness and mercy follow me. And I like all that, but that's our Sunday morning language. But then we get in the car. I got cameras on the parking lot. I can see it all. Here's what he's saying. He's usual. Here's what I'm asking you. What usual words need less time in your life? What are some usual words that we use? We just got, we just got lazy with. And what rare words need more time? What are words that we don't say enough of that just, just need more time? See, our words are not neutral. They either heal or bring pain. They either encourage or they discourage. And if you think about it, if you go back in your life and you think about someone who's hurt you or discouraged you, it was usually with words. If you think about someone who encouraged you or blessed you or helped you, it was usually with words. I'll never forget a moment And it was the first Sunday in this church building here. We started off at Indian Trails Middle School. And then from there we went to a a warehouse that was renovated, much smaller than this, outgrew that, multiple services. And we moved in this building with a lot of help from a lot of people, an extreme amount of generosity. And besides that, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And we moved into it with a lot of challenges and issues and permitting and all of that and we were delayed and all of that. But I remember our first Sunday in here. And it culminated a lot of result of a lot of faith. Again, generosity. I was so excited to be in this building. And we did our first service. And we put, have more, more chairs in here now in that first service. It was one service. It was completely packed out. Every seat was taken. And I was just so excited that we were actually in here. Forget that anybody came. That excited me too. But I just, 
It was the journey. And so I get done and I walk out there. I love out by the door, shaking hands, talking to people. And a lady walked up to me with her son. And she said, I said, I can see God all over him. She goes, well, pastor, I brought my son. And God was all over him. And then she made this fatal sentence. She said, I, he didn't want to come. I had to drag him to church. And literally right before my eyes, I saw his countenance change. I saw just God lift off of his life. And what I'm saying is our words connect or disconnect us from people. In a moment, everything changed for him. I like this quote. Be mindful when it comes to your words. A string of some that don't mean much to you may stick with someone else for a lifetime. That's how important our words are. Paul would say the same thing in Ephesians 5. And I'm just starting to wrap it up right now for you. Paul said this, when it comes to relationships, he's talking about marriage. This would apply to any relationship. Roommates, friendships, work relationships. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Here's what he said. Your words either wash people or degrade people. We, we, come on, some of us guys, we sandblast with our words. And I'm just going to say this. I've been, my wife, Dina never ever complains to me when I say, hey darling, you're looking really beautiful today. She said, I don't even have my makeup on. I said, I know, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when you put your makeup on. She said, oh, you're just saying that. You, you're just saying that. I said, no honey, you're beautiful. She, she'll, never, she'll never complain when I call her princess. My, people I work with will never, they never complain when I call them out, p- p- praise them publicly. In fact, leadership law, law would be this, criticize privately, praise publicly. I never, I never complain. When Dina, I, I was up, I was, dealing with a situation a few weeks ago in another state with a church and, and, and I was talking and I'd meet with staff and board members and, and then I did a question and answer and all this and, and when I got done, I, was, I got done, Dina said in front of everybody in the back room, she goes, I'm always amazed at how much wisdom comes out of him. I was like, that's right, babe. That's right. Hey, you know what, Dina? You need a new purse. That's what I think. words. We get to wash people. They're out in the world and they're getting dirty all day. Rubbing with people and people want stuff from them constantly. What angle are people and it's getting dirty, getting dirty. We get to come home and get washed by each other. Here's here's what I'd say. Let's say get a takeaway. Here's some things I want you to say. I want to refuse a couple things. I'm going to refuse gossip. I just am because gossip is powerful. In fact, if you're young, hey, can I just take a moment? Can I just want to welcome all the UCF students are back in town. Aren't we glad to have them? Come on. Tonight, young adult service, young adult service tonight. It's going to be a powerful, I'm not going to tell you what John Mark's preaching on, but there's a great word up here. And um, gossip, it's powerful. It hurts, it divides. Sarcasm. And I get it. This is my language of choice. Doesn't make it right though. Someone says, I can't believe you said that. Man, if you saw what was in my mind, you'd be happy that's what I said. (laughs) But sarcasm, lying, the Lord just, it's a big deal, God. Discouragement, I mean, I refuse. I'm I'm gonna encourage, not discourage. Just hate. I'm gonna use my words to hate on people. Anger, I'm I'm just gonna refuse those. But what I'm going to choose and respond and that is I'm going to choose prayer. I'm going to use my words to call God's best down on people. I'm going to choose encouragement. I'm going to choose kindness. That's what I'm going to choose. Yeah, but it's, if you knew who I worked with, I know. 
This is why I said I choose, not I feel. I get it. I get it, too. Traffic, I-4, I understand all that. But I choose kindness. I choose truth. It hurts, it's a little inconvenient on the front end. But boy, it pays off in the back end. I choose love. And I choose to speak to people's potential. Now, I just took a spiritual law and this spiritual law but the power of your words is probably one of the most difficult things that we have, were challenged with I took it and I made it very very pastoral if you say I want to be in a church that pastors me you just got a message on that pastored you yet I know for doing this for all these years including myself I need help in this area I I struggle on this myself at times. That I can't, it's hard to change bad habits. It just is. It's just hard to change things that are rooted in our life, especially generationally. Three and four and five generations, and this is the way my dad spoke or my mom spoke, or this is the home my grandparents I grew up in. This is the guys I run with, the girls I run with. This is what they do. It's just hard to break. So how, how do you change your words? What I will tell you is this, a message like this will be a great start, but it won't finish anything. There has to be some choices that we have to make. And maybe a four-part series just became a five-part series right now, maybe. But here's what we do. We need the, the help of the Holy Spirit. We just got to give the Holy Spirit room in our life. Just need us, We need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit he, he wants to help you he's not an addition to your faith he wants to be with you every day there's a phrase when it comes to communication and it comes to interacting with people there's a phrase that you've heard you've got to fight fire with Shakespeare made that that phrase famous but actually literally the term fight fire with fire, it's, there's a literal term, and there's a, it's how you actually fight real fires. When these forest fires come, and they just come through sucking up all the oxygen and sucking up all the resources and finding timber, what firefighters will do is they'll create what they call a controlled burn, a small little fire to control. So when the big fire comes, There's nothing left for it to consume, and it dies off. And I was thinking about that thought, because when the early church started in Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And this is the verse that you know. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking, that's what the role of the Holy Spirit is, to create a fire on the inside of us. And it's sort of like a controlled burn. So when the big fire comes, when the big issues come, here's what we can rely on, that the Holy Spirit will help you talk right. The Holy Spirit will help you respond. I think, wouldn't would it be a great prayer to pray? Instead of saying, God, fix this person. God, change this. What if we got really mature today and said, God, I want to change. Lord, light a fire in me. Holy Spirit, I just don't want some of you. Holy Spirit, I want all of you. What a difference would it make in our homes, in our families, on our relationships. Let's just pray this prayer. If you just open up your heart to receive whatever that posture looks like to you, if you want to open your hands, whatever that is. Father, in a moment like this, Lord, talking about our words, I think all of us are impacted by this, Lord. All of us are affected by this. All of us have words. 
that were spoken over us that are painful, that have clung to us all of our life. Words that someone that we loved, someone that we trusted said over us. And in some cases, we believed them. And Lord, today I'm just breaking the power of those words over people's lives. And I thank you, Father, that today people are walking out of here with that chain broken over their life, that burden broken over their life, that bondage, that those words have just slaved, enslaved people, trapped them. Father, I'm declaring they are free in Jesus' name. Father, because you're going to have the final say. The words that you say are the most important. And that is, if God be for us, who can be against us? In all things, we are more than conquerors. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But Father, there's another group of us that maybe we're the ones that have been speaking those words. And so, Holy Spirit, we're asking you to help us. Holy Spirit, in a moment like this, we're saying we want all of you. I'm asking you to fill us, Holy Spirit. I'm asking you, Father, just to take this to a whole nother level in our lives, your walk with us. And Father, if there's words that we're getting ready to say that we shouldn't say, Lord, I'm asking by the Holy Spirit you would arrest us. And Father, before the big fire comes, I'm praying you do a work on the inside of us. Lord, so we can respond in ways that please you, but also ways that build the future that we so desperately want. Father, I'm asking for it in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, there's a moment in our services that you've instructed us to do. It's where I don't talk, but you talk. So Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts right now? Holy Spirit, would you take the words that were spoken today and would they become seeds planted deep in people's hearts? Just let God speak to you right where you are.